Hello, everybody. We are back to the next and last session. And the next speaker is Alexei Mishenko that will give a talk about numerics and computation in geodefinitic simulations for electromagnetic turbulence. I don't know if uh, Alexei is ready to go. Yeah, yeah I'm, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Can Yeah. Okay. Good. Then you can share your screen. It starts, yes. Okay, go ahead and you want. Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizing for giving me and my co-authors this opportunity to talk uh, about numerics and computation and geokinetic simulations of electromagnetic turbulence with global particle and cell codes. And uh, the actual goal uh, of our simulations is uh, to describe uh, burning plasmas uh, using electromagnetic, um, solving electromagnetic, global electromagnetic gyrokinetic equations. Uh, burning plasmas are complex systems uh, with multiple special and temporal scales. And um, there will be a substantial, substantial energetic particle minority, which is going to couple electromagnetic turbulence, um, global alpha uh, instabilities, MHD modes, uh, excite zonal flows, as we heard already this morning in some talks. Uh, it is desired, it would be good to have a single framework which uh, would include all these parts of this problem. And uh, this task uh, is, uh, well, uh, can be probably solved very quite successfully on future exascale systems. So it's, uh, this, this uh, study, the sort of preparation to future exascale system can be seen this way. Uh, so this is our goal, and regarding the tool, um, we would like to use uh, already existing and successfully uh, working uh, code SORP5 and UTOP. Both have uh, already been mentioned today on different occasions. Um, this is gyrokinetic particle and cell codes, and uh, they have been proposed as um, important uh, part of uh, Eurovision task, uh, TSVV task 10. Um, one of the um, technical or infrastructural steps, uh, uh, important and uh, um, which would require a lot of work, would be to refactor these two codes, uh, aiming at a single framework uh, for, for global gyrokinetic particle and cell simulations of burning plasmas. In this talk, I will describe first some peculiarities of electromagnetic simulation, the so-called uh, conservation problem, then a uh, solution of this problem using mixed variable uh, gyrokinetics, and then I will show some simulations, uh, address uh, GPU enabling aspects, and uh, yeah, give some outlook. So the cancellation problem. The cancellation problem is uh, um, well known uh, in the gyrokinetic simulation community, it uh, has prohibited uh, big uh, global simulations, uh, uh, electromagnetic gyrokinetic simulations for some while. Uh, to understand that we have to look on a particular, on, on gyrokinetic system equations in, um, in uh, the so-called PPRL formulation, which is normally used. And uh, here you can uh, see that this uh, formulation includes normal, uh, gyrokinetic class of equation, uh, which is um, formulated in terms of the gyro center orbits, and the system is closed by field equation, the quasi neutrality equation, and the Ampere's law. And this uh, Ampere's law, you can see these terms marked with red color. Uh, these two terms are not uh, physical, they are related to the particular formulation of the gyrokinetic theory chosen, and they must be canceled by um, corresponding contributions to the currents uh, on the right-hand side, which are also of technical nature because of the formulation. 
Now, uh, the problem here is uh, that um, discretization in particle and cell uh, codes involves uh, climatologic representation for the top distribution function, which will then be used to compute the moments in the field locations. And the uh, finite element discretization for the fields uh, using grid, um, some grid uh, in real space. Uh, the consequence is that in uh, this equation, for example, the uh, left hand side and the right hand side are discretized uh, in uh, some in a different way. And now, if you we look, if you, if you take a look on this particular term, we see one of a zero radius squared. This is quite small number, and um, even small inconsistencies in uh, in the accuracy. Uh, can lead to quite uh, unpleasant consequences, such as shown in this uh, figure on the slide. Here uh, we have electromagnetic simulations of electromagnetic ITG mode and LHG like geometry, and we see a quite severe instability, numerical instability, which appears at the very beginning of this simulation with uh, completely unphysical um, uh, structure of everything uh, spectra, uh, radial mode structure evolution, uh, it just yeah, numerically unstable very quickly. And this type of um, unpleasant um, results uh, is uh, rather typical in the solar data and the tokamak geometry if nothing is done for uh, to fix, uh, to mitigate this cancellation problem. Uh, there are ways to mitigate it. And the way we use uh, now is based on a mixed variable gyrokinetics. And this uh, particular formulation uh, we uh, deliberately split the magnetic potential into the symplectic and Hamiltonian parts, and then proceed uh, with a normal standard uh, uh, derivation based, for example, on lead transform approach. And uh, we end up with some system of equation just by doing uh, standard steps. And uh, OK, so we have our gyrocentrum orbits. Uh, since we have introduced kind of additional field by this uh, splitting, of uh, we had just one uh, magnetic potential, now we have two. Uh, this is an additional degree of freedom, which has to be con compensated by some constraint, which is free to choose. And uh, we choose this one, which is um, yeah, ideal Ohm's law for this particular uh, component of the, of the magnetic potential. And then we have also field equations. So the system is not very much different compared to the original one. Uh, one uh, additional equation needs to be solved, but this is not a very difficult equation. Uh, and this is an algorithm. Um, yeah, this is also kind of key step. Uh, we, we, uh, we start in, um, well, symplectic variable space means that uh, this a parallel s uh, is, 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 is zero. A parallel h is zero. Uh, so we start, we start in symplectic variable space uh, in which a parallel h is zero, we follow the um, uh, mixed variable trajectories. And at the end of uh, every uh, time step, we uh, make this transformation. Uh, we go back from mix mixed variable uh, space back to the symplectic variable step space. And this uh, process is repeated on, on every time step. Uh, so this algorithm is very uh, rather straightforward to implement, and it does not introduce um, any um, substantial um, computation uh, uh, yeah, uh, complications. Uh, so we, we use this approach in, in, in several codes, uh, for example, in Utopia. Uh, here, uh, we have exactly the same simulation uh, as I've shown a couple of slides before. I'm coming, going back, this one. This one was uh, performed uh, in uh, P uh, parallel, using P parallel gyrokinetics was not so good. If we just uh, change uh, our formulation of the gyrokinetic theory and do nothing to numerical parameters, nothing else, we end up with uh, this clean uh, result, uh, which goes for a long time and generates rather smooth uh, solution in, in all the representations, time evolution, it looks nice. Uh, Fourier spectrum looks also not bad and uh, uh, the radial mode structure is, 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 is fine. Clean mode is observed uh, without any, uh, any change in the numerical parameters. Uh, as example, uh, I've been showing here also some W7X. Uh, results uh, here, um, well, we have some spectras, uh, mode spectras, 
uh, of their um, electrostatic potential, but this uh, electromagnetic simulation with this beta equal to 2%. And uh, yeah, this is just an example, but what we have done here, we played a little, a little bit with, um, with gradients, with profiles. Yeah, it's not like a local simulation, we have a number for gradient, we have a profile. And uh, yeah, we had a flat electron temperature and density in, in, in this case. Then we had a flat density um, in this case with ion and electron temperature gradients. And this one corresponds to flat electron temperature and there is a gradient in ion temperature and densities. We see that the mode uh, structures uh, change, uh, react uh, in, in a healthy way uh, to, to different uh, types of profiles. And uh, this kind of uh, study is related, um, for example, uh, to applications such as stability really found in W7X uh, using uh, local simulations. Uh, here we are doing it in using global uh, code. Uh, yeah, but the message here is that for all profiles, uh, numerically clean mode is observed despite the fact that we are fully electromagnetic, include kinetic electrons with realistic mass ratio at beta equal to percent. And this is linear in this case, uh, utopia. Another quote uh, which uh, also uses this pullback formulation is R5. Now we have nonlinear uh, non saturation uh, turbulence uh, with uh, many uh, poloidal and toroidal modes involved, so broadband turbulence. Uh, and I have here two cases, low beta case on the left with this beta and a uh, larger beta case on the right with this beta. Uh, we see that, uh, well, first of all, the simulation is healthy, it's okay. Uh, some slides later, I will show uh, heat flux corresponding to this to this case. Uh, so it's, it's not like a numerically a troublesome uh, situation, it looks good. And we see also that uh, low beta um, turbulence is uh, um, dominated by zonal flow saturation mechanism, uh, whereas the high beta case uh, is dominated by um, uh, some global eigen mode, in this case, BAE uh, eigen mode, uh, which you can see here, uh, including its uh, nonlinear harmonics. Uh, physics changes if we, if we change the parameters. If we go from low beta to high beta using global code, we have different physics. This result is preliminary, uh, of course, uh, kind of uh, new, and uh, this uh, new physics, uh, changed physics, uh, shall be studied with ORC5 in detail uh, in, um, in, in next, uh, in near time. Now, essentially, starting now. Uh, another example I'm having here is for ITER. Uh, this is not exactly ITER, this is um, downsized, downscaled ITER. We have ITER geometry, ITER uh, mass spec ratio, safety factor, everything ITER, but uh, plasma profiles, uh, raw star, uh, are like in cyclone base case. Uh, and we have also low beta here. Uh, we are going to, uh, so this is, um, also work in progress. Uh, this is going to be a starting point, a point for our future uh, steps towards realistic ITER, with realistic ITER parameters. But this is not like uh, some ad hoc, uh, larger spectra circular um, cross-section uh, tokamak. It's, it's, it's either ITER geometry was uh, changed the uh, size. Uh, yeah, okay, so we can see that the heat flux is fine. Uh, of course, this needs to be studied in much more detail in terms of physics and numerics, but it doesn't look, it looks fine. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a turbulence. Uh, this simulation has been uh, performed using uh, PRA's uh, computing time on uh, MyCoin 100 and uh, we thank for that opportunity. Okay, so uh, last code to be shown uh, here is uh, XDC. Uh, which is a DOE code. Uh, it has recently, um, yeah, we have recently implemented uh, this um, uh, mixed variable agile kinetics, uh, including pullback transform into this code. And this is one of the first results with this new scheme uh, here, uh, new for, for XGC. Uh, 
here you can see a KDM, KDM instability, linear instability, at this beta, reduced mass ratio. Uh, and um, well, this example is that reduced mass ratio, realistic mass ratio is also possible. This is not a problem, also more expensive. Uh, then uh, this case corresponds to what is known as Gola benchmark, or and it has been this is this is a benchmark which has been performed uh, within uh, enabling research looking project. Okay, this is calling computation. Now I'm sorry about this. Now uh, a GPU aspect. Uh, GPU uh, enabling in general kinetic peak. Uh, okay, so this slide is just to illustrate that um, GPU. I cannot talk now. Uh, this slide is uh, to illustrate uh, uh, importance of GPUs uh, in HPC. Uh, it shows well. The main statement is fraction of computer time with mandatory GPUs is increasing. This is one um, kind of fact. Uh, issue problem in these circumstances, if uh, codes do not have GPU enabling, they may have difficulties with computer time and uh, with uh, results, papers, and so on. So codes running on uh, new systems, they have competitive advantage, obviously. And this example, uh, I have uh, what uh, well, some, this, some, um, illustration from recent PAs uh, call with uh, different machines uh, participating, which, which, which have, uh, yeah, could, would provide computer time uh, for, for, for the projects, uh, successful projects. And uh, one sees that quite a substantial fraction is uh, GPU mandatory. So this is serious uh, point uh, to be addressed uh, from, from, from this uh, trend. Uh, point of view of this term. So we have here some or all five has been GPU enabled and uh, this is one of the figures which uh, could uh, help uh, uh, get computing time on GPU enabled architectures. Uh, here we see that uh, CPU only is obviously slower than CPU plus GPU so GPUs are working for five. And uh, this is another illustration. Here we have Simulation on Marconi, same case, same parameters, everything is the same. Marconi, and this is uh, uh, Marconi 100, and Chenta. Uh, yes, uh, in this case, we needed uh, 48 hours on 24 Marconi nodes to get to 60, this point, 60,000 60, time, as you see, time step, and uh, we needed 24 hours on 16 and 100 nodes to get to you know, much longer, up to three, well, not three, but uh, 150,000 time steps. Uh, so this is not very um, accurate or, um, yeah, uh, this is just kind of emotional comparison. If you, if you run, if you run uh, on one machine and you need several restarts and you need some queuing, and you get somehow to a certain point, and then you start the same simulation on another machine, and you get much further, uh, much quicker without uh, without the skewing issues, uh, which can be uh, problematic without restarts. This is, uh, of course, a big difference from practice practice point of view, practical point of view. Of course, uh, uh, this uh, all uh, GPU is, uh, story is sort of new. I I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Uh, this this uh, is new and. Uh, we are learning. Uh, so one of the things uh, we have observed is uh, memory volatility at a large number of nodes. There are crashes with out of memory. They can be solved, but uh, we do not have very good recipe for that. Uh, this needs to be studied in, in much more detail. Uh, and we do not know if this is because of some uh, details of open ACC implementation or some issues with, uh, with PDI compiler environment or some issues uh, with configuration of, of, of GPUs. Uh, these are kind of uh, Two possibilities. Yes, uh, status and out. Uh, so status, uh, we have tokamak, I've shown some tokamak and some stellarity simulations. For tokamaks, majority of results have been obtained with R5. We have seen uh, electromagnetic simulations uh, in ad hoc geometry and uh, downscaled ether. R5, uh, 
we have also other results not shown for Aztecs and uh, realistic either uh, for alpha and eigen modes. The code runs in GPUs. There are some, we are, we are learning. We are still in learning process uh, for this hardware. For stellarator simulations, ORP5 is not an option. Utopia is must. And uh, we have electromagnetic linear stabilities there and some electrostatic uh, turbulence studies. Uh, well, uh, the issue if we go to large machine size uh, with turbulence uh, is memory, big matrices. Uh, then we have noise control and stellarators, which is sort of new step. Uh, there is a reference. And uh, Utopia is CPU only. Uh, however, the push is similar to ORP5. So GPU enabling can be maybe done using this uh, similarity. Okay, and this is probably kind of outlook, which I, I get. yeah, okay. I can just leave it like this. Okay, thank Thanks. you, Alexei. We have time for some questions and we have some, we have a couple of questions by Yuhol Holo. Uh, first one, since the splitting of vector potential introduces the time derivative in the geomagnetic equation, what's the reason to keep the Hamiltonian part and not to use the syntactic de representation all the way? Yeah, it, it introduces, uh, well, yeah. the point is that it does introduce a time derivative here. And uh, this can be, a, you can solve it using explicit solvers. Simple, no problem. If you had only simplex, if, if you had uh, no Hamiltonian part, you would get some GA dt in, in, in this equation. Well, here, of course, you have GA dt, but you, 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 you cancel it. You cancel it. it. It appears formally, and then you cancel this one and that one. So at the end, you do not have GA dt at all. And you can use explicit method. If you if you don't do the splitting, uh, you 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 end up with some time derivative in this equation, which is not cancelled, and you have to use implicit, which is more expensive. Okay, we have another question. What's the bottleneck for the GPU as a parallelization? Particle pushing, field solver. Field solver is not on GPUs. The bottleneck uh, practically is, is memory, GPU memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I'm curious about the, this uh, porting to GPUs. You showed some results and the comparison was the speed up between using GPUs or not using them is uh, around a factor three, isn't it? Four or five. It depends. It depends on parameters. Uh, it seems uh, to be a, a modest uh, factor, isn't it? Because I don't know how many computing cores has have the GPUs in Marconi, but maybe some thousands. Marconi hundred. Marconi hundred. Yeah. Well, uh, they have uh, four GPUs per node. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're asking how many threads each, each GPU has or? Yeah, I, I don't really know the exact number of cores or computing cores that uh, each GPU has, but I imagine that they, they are in- well, the thousands of thousands. Thousands. Yes. So you are yes, introducing 4,000 computing cores and you you get a speed up of uh, four or five or not too much. Yeah, but these are not cores, these are threads. This is not the yeah, same. Yeah, I understand, yeah. This is not the same. Um, the uh, practical, well, it is not so easy to get code running on GPU to, to begin with. Uh, from status, from how we have it now, uh, making code running on GPU is not is not is not is not an easy task for people who are doing science and not uh, um, computer center specialists. Uh, first thing. Second thing, uh, from practical point of view, if you reduce uh, your simulation time from days to hours, this is really a big difference, practically. You do not have to wait one week, and one week you may forget what you thought at the beginning. Uh, if, if you, uh, uh, 
So practically, and there are all these queue, uh, you have to wait. Each restart you wait uh, before the job starts. And uh, well, what else? Um, yeah, th this sort of things from days to hours. Uh, this is important, I would say. I mean, so if you can, if you if if you can imagine getting like factor thousand just by using GPUs, I don't think anybody has it. This is not uh, quite accurate to say that you have like thousand cores equivalent to some. No, this is not the case. And not every piece can be put on GPUs. So, particle and cell, this Monte Carlo part, market part, is of course uh, uh, well, well suited for this. Or better suited. Okay, thank you. Share my screen now, okay. now right? Okay. Um, I hardly hear you. Uh, now you hear me well? A bit better, but not too much. Um. um now a bit better. Same. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not too uh, much. Uh, up, up. I'm not sure. Shall I change microphone? Yeah, the, now it's a bit better, maybe. Yes. You are getting closer to the microphone. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Let's try. Let's okay, try. now it's better. Okay. Let's um, try. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and uh, for the organizing committee for, for this workshop. Um, I'm going to share with you in this presentation our work on uh, titled Mechanical Energy Transfer in Liquid Metal MSD Flows in DCL and Breathing Blanket Singularities. Uh, my name is Daniel Suarez. I'm PhD candidate uh, for the Department of Physics in UPC in the Advanced Nuclear Technologies Research Group. And... Uh, uh, let me outline a little bit my my speech. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce a little bit myself and the PhD uh, thesis context where this work is framed on. The later I'm going to to talk about the component I I'm studying in this work, and the later I'm going to move to the compressible MHD phenomena which we found in liquid metal flows in the breathing blanket. Later, I'm going to explain you our problems and solutions on the assessment of the mechanical energy balance that we found on our work and the application of such uh, such uh, understanding on uh, MHC liquid metal expansion. And, fi and finally, some remarks will be gathered to, to, to finish the presentation. Uh, in order to introduce a little bit myself, I've been working for 10 years in nuclear power plant, uh, fission nuclear power plant as operations instructor in the this control room uh, simulator where I teach operators. Uh, I've been working for six years in my PhD part-time on fusion uh, nuclear engineering and five years uh, as, as a assistant professor at UPC. Uh, Technotom is the company uh, I'm, I'm working for in the private sector. Uh, the motivation of the PhD thesis is uh, associated with the, the transfer phenomena and uh, heat and mass transfer correlations for liquid metal MHC for liquid metal flows under nuclear fusion conditions, supervised by uh, Dr. Yus Batet and Dr. Elizabeth Mas de las Valls. And it's based on the fact that when we analyze the system, big hydraulic system, uh, we usually uh, use this sort of system codes, which are note after note um, uh, transfer uh, uh, transfer models to to assess the dynamics of a, of a power plant system for design purposes, for instance. Mm -hmm. In those sort of systems, node after, after node systems, we assess these transfer phenomena as, uh, as, as, as uh, some, using some correlations based on the experimental data. Um, for example, here we see the ditus bolter correlation for heat transfer uh, coefficient for the Nusselt number. The idea in this thesis was to use experimental uh, numerical experiments uh, done by uh, by CFD codes. In this case, I'm using open foam uh, that give 3D results. We, we call them a component code. Post-processing them would allow us to extract some uh, transfer coefficient. We call them bridge coefficient that can allow for the assessment of this uh, transfer phenomena for momentum. This would be the friction tapsis uh, friction factor the Nussel number, which is the heat transfer and the Sherwood for the mass transfer. 
uh, phenomena and later uh, correlate them after several uh, a long a long uh, a large number of simulations to correlate those results and uh, later implement those correlations for a system code in order to uh, do this uh, this plant dynamic uh, evaluation okay uh, the component of a study yesterday i was talking to a friend who i had to explain what was the phd about and I, 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 mod, I, I did this metaphor of the tokamak as the donut shape. And in order to, to put the, the blanket on, on, on the context of this, the breathing blanket is what surrounds this donut, right? So somehow I had uh, this, this metaphor that uh, the breathing blanket somehow is uh, the chocolate that, we, that surrounds this donut, what makes all of us working a little bit on bakery, right? The idea of this... Um, uh, chocolate uh, metaphor makes that uh, tells us that there are different types of chocolate as there are different types of breathing blanket concepts. In the case uh, I'm working on uh, is the what we call the, the dual coulomb lead lithium, which is uh, based on the fact that we use uh, two different uh, coulombs. First one is helium that will flow through the, those small channels and uh, its function is basically to allow the materials to work uh, within the, the temperature constraints for their integrity. And later we have the lead lithium for flowing through those channels, those vertical channels, which are meant to extract uh, heat, uh, breathe tritium, and also to, uh, to, um, to bind uh, the, uh, the neutron flux for the coils, for example, right? So this dual coulomb lead lithium is characterized by high velocity lead lithium flow under the magnetic field, which arises the incompressible MSG phenomena. The case of this study uh, was uh, was um, uh, to to uh, analyze the distribution, the flow distribution on the manifold that is right behind those poloidal channels. And this uh, back manifold is what uh, I'm going to explain to you a bit further. The incompressible MSD phenomena for for liquid metal is characterized by those equations, which is the continuity equation for incompressible flows. Um, momentum equation where we can encounter this uh, Lorentz force and the Ohm's law, which is this uh, fourth equation here, the, the divergence of that Ohm's law gives us to the to the uh, Poisson equation for the electric potential uh, equation that is the main uh, mag uh, electric uh, variable that we that we calculate. And the and in here in the right part of the slide. We represent the different um, flow uh, velocity profiles that we can encounter in, in liquid metal MHD. Uh, we have these jets appearing for high conductivity walls, or uh, you have this sort of cake flat uh, profile in case of an isolating uh, uh, walls. The cold manifold uh, distributes the flow through these poloidal uh, channels. The idea of this back manifold is that there are. Um, inlet area on the bottom that is the same area on the outlet with a smaller velocity because some of those flow that flow goes perpendicular to these channels so basically if we add all the areas on the outlet are larger than the area on the inlet right um, in the analysis we studied the head loss the hydraulic head loss of that component that uh, was based on the Bernoulli principle which is uh, widely used for uh, hydraulic system systems and um, it's based on the fact that mechanical energy is made of potential pressure energy and mean uh, kinetic energy using the mean velocity value uh, and the mechanical energy of point one of a system one point of the system uh, had to be conserved in a point two of the system further so if there is some uh, mechanical uh, kinetic energy loss for, in, for instance, a pressure energy would, would recover, for instance, would increase. Um, and the, what doesn't fit in this uh, conservation principle is basically some energy loss considered as head loss, right? So this Bernoulli principle is based on some hypothesis like the flow is steady, it's frictionless, uh, there is no shaft work involved or that the flow is incompressible and there are no heat transfer involved in this case. And there is the last uh, hypothesis that says that the flow goes along a streamline. But uh, the streamline, for, extent, for instance, the streamline hypothesis is something that we have, we have to suspect about because in CFD, we don't have a streamline. We have 3D results, right? The case is that when we analyze the results with this 
point of view, this Bernoulli point of view, we, we, we found out that the piece generated energy. So somehow we, we just solved all the, the energy problems uh, right in this calculation, which was of, of course something clearly wrong, right? Uh, we, we encountered that our methodology for calculating this were clearly wrong. And we had to analyze it a little bit further. We realized that since uh, we have to fulfill continuity, if the outlet area, the overall outlet area was larger than the inlet area, which would be in an expansion, for instance, the velocity in the outlet would drop, right? So that pressure on the outlet would increase. So finding that pressure at the outlet was higher than in the inlet was something that we could even expect, right? Um, the fact is that uh, that explained that, yes, the pressure on the outlet can be larger, but head loss had to be positive. We cannot have head gain. It makes no sense that we generate energy, right, in this domain. And after several months of studying the, the basics of how Bernoulli principle was derived from, uh, we realized that um, using the energy conservation principle applied to a fixed control volume, we could consider these three case that we studied in the CFD um, as uh, a bunch of inlets and outlets associated with each uh, phase of the cells on the boundaries. Uh, with this point of view, we could analyze two minutes. The, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we could analyze the the energy uh, the power loss on the domain, so the head loss of the domain, uh, the fully developed head losses on the upstream and downstream pipe. We could obtain the head loss of the singularity. Okay. We validated this approach with a, with a hydrodynamic uh, well-known cases as sudden contractions and expansions, and we found out, for example that, uh, for instance, a pressure drop in an expansion, as we said, could be negative because uh, it gains pressure somehow, but head loss and in, the, um, in this uh, same scenario, it, it keeps positive. So results were, were well validated. Each of, the, of these points is one uh, CFD simulation. We applied this methodology to calculate the head losses uh, on, a, on an expansion. Uh, on an MHD liquid metal expansion that can be a sim the simpler case when we had some benchmark uh, information for, uh, for a conducting walls, uh, liquid metal MHD expansion in the direction of the magnetic field, as you can see here for different Hartmann numbers, which means different uh, magnetic field uh, intensities. And this, this, this is the direction of the flow, this X axis is the direction of the flow. And in this direction, we can, we can find in the expansion that the higher the Harman, the higher the jets that appear in the expansion region, which is in this, this way, right? And here on the right, we see that the higher the Harman, the higher the magnetic field, the higher the uh, pressure drop, which was something that we could expect. So eventually um, we uh, obtained this result that uh, a pressure drop in MHD expansions uh, will not be negative pressure drop, but, um, head loss can account much better for the for the uh, the power losses that we can encounter and eventually this will be the effort that the pump has to has to uh, has to do, do to to impulse that uh, that flow so uh, in order to finish my presentation just to say that the mechanical energy losses calculation method was developed to retrieve the bridge parameters from a cfd three dimensional result and necessary to to design the hydraulic system we use the multi-material incompressible MHD code developed uh, at UBC. And uh, currently we are uh, doing some parametric scanning in order to analyze the, uh, the head losses coefficient in MHD expansion using the Marconi HPC at Sinica. And uh, this will allow us to, to increase the Hartmann number, which is the most, um, the most uh, limiting uh, dimensionless number because it requires more, uh, more uh, number of cells, okay? So thank you very much. This is my contact information and um, ready if there is any, any question. For... Thank you for the talk. We have time for maybe one question because we are running out of time. Yeah, we have one by Luis. All your analysis apply perfectly contact materials. What happened if helium, helium would uh, build an isolating, maybe regular or unstable interface between LM and the insert. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I think, in my opinion, in my opinion, 
uh, it depends on the magnitude of the of the bubbling. If uh, we have a large amount of bubbles in the flow that could somehow accumulate on the boundaries, that might influence the electric current uh, streamlines, I would say. So that may that could make the channel to be uh, more isolated. So basically, head losses would decrease because the conductivity of the walls tend to increase head losses on the on the uh, liquid metal channel flows. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we should go for the last talk of this session. It is by Jonathan Simwell. And it's going to talk about the Paramac, an automatic parametric geometry construction for fusion reactors. Are you ready, Jonathan? Yes, already here. Thanks. Thank you. Is that screen share working for you? Yeah. Super, super. Okay. Let's get let's get rolling. Um, so this is going to be a, a quick uh, whistle stop tour of um, making parametric fusion reactors uh, models with CAD. And this is um, I'm your guide for the day, John. Um, but the real driving force between this code is uh, these two here, John and Remy, who have been amazing for the whole project. So it's just uh, it's lovely to present at this really well organized. Um, HPC conference. Thanks for having me. Um, so why should we bother with um, automatic geometry construction? So you might you might be sitting at your desk one day and someone will come up with a back of the envelope paper tissue sketch and they will say, please make me a CAD model. So the traditional approach would be you, you get out CATIA and you start manually using that GUI to, to make a CAD model. I realize not everyone does that, but this is this is fairly common. Um, and then you you finish the CAD model and it's project done. Um, and then a different person will pick up that CAD model and say, "Oh dear, it's got a few it's got a few errors in. I have to clean it because um, my use case is um, the CAD model needs to be very clean, watertight. Otherwise, um, it can't be used in neutronic simulations, for example, which is what I I have a background in." So I've lived this um, circle a few times and it can be a bit painful, especially this last step where you, you want a new model and you, you feed back your analysis and you say, this thing gets too hot, let's change the dimensions and make it a little bit thinner or further back or something. And you, you need this design cycle and, and it works very well at the moment, I think. Um, this is a design cycle that's tried and tested where it doesn't work well is if, you, if you're on an early pre-concept design study and you want to do tens of thousands of simulations, tens of thousands of models. Um, so this is where we're at in the design cycle for step at the moment in UK AEA. We, we don't know what the reactor shape is, so we want tens of thousands of models to simulate and try out. And where this was previously done at three separate stages, we want to combine these all in one so that the geometry creation is really fit for purpose and we want to eliminate the manual stages in the construction. So how might you go about that? Here's a model we all love, um, Eurofusion EU demo. Let's take, uh, let's decompose this a little bit and, and say, how could you represent this um, with parameters? So first off, you have a plasma and a plasma you could just represent as a load of coordinates connected together with a curved surface, a spline surface, um, and rotated through a set number of degrees. You have a, an inner column here with um, straight edges and just four coordinates, even easier, and rotated by a fixed number of degrees. And then you have a few other bits. Here's a blanket and here's a diverter and, and other things. But all of these can be represented by straight lines with splines between them. Um, so this would give you a really rough model. These are all rotation operations, but we can do extrude operations as well. The bio shield is a fixed thickness and it's extruded by a um, fixed amount, a distance. So I think that starts to set the scene for how can we decompose the CAD models that we want and make them. 
So the method relies on 12 underlying parametric shapes, which are really the core of the whole program. We build upon that with components. We've currently got 33 components, but this is increasing every week. Um, and these are the components that you might see in a fusion reactor and you might want to use, you might want parameterized. And then the result of these components, stitching them together in different ways, is these lovely six reactors. Um, so you can see we've got a few different designs here, which I'll talk about later. I expect we'll have, we'll have um, 10 by Christmas or so. Th these numbers have been increasing as time goes by. So the, the base shapes are really great, um, but they're really difficult for humans to use. So they're great because all they require is coordinates. You input coordinates, you input a, an operation like rotate, extrude, or sweep, and you get your 3D geometry. Um, you can do further complicated things like Boolean operations, union intersection cut, and you can do repeating patterns like the TF coils. You might want 12 TF coils repeating around the Z axis. This can all be done with shape class. Um, but the, the difficulty for humans when using this is the provision of the data points, the coordinates. You don't want to have to do that for a whole reactor. So let's try to explain that further. Here's a really simple, let's call it a blanket shape, where we've got five shape, five coordinates, and they're connected with um, straight lines or splines. So this is the X, Y position of these coordinates, and this is the connectivity to the next point. And this is the Paramac in its most primitive form, making a, um, a blanket, um, blanket-like object. But if you wanted to parameterize, you could wrap that shape with some driving parameters. Let's say offset from the middle, at, offset from the middle at the bottom, and the height. This this would be design specific, but it's it's what you want to vary in your design. And then you you wrap that other code. So now we've got the same function, but we're providing those points with the parameters that have been specified. So these parameters are much easier for a user to think about than these points. And um, that, that's the basic essence of moving from a parametric shape driven by coordinates to a parametric component. We, um, we kind of sandbox the user interface and we end up with this, this selection. These are the simplest parametric coordinates uh, components that we have. And we have um, a couple of blankets. These ones are used for cutting out ports, uh, cooling channels, uh, a simple TF coil, uh, a wedge shaped, uh, really simple shapes. What I like about this slide is we've got in the lower left, we've got two, two different PF coils and the user can specify the same geometry in different ways, depending on what they have. So if they've got width and height and center point, they can make it like that. But if they just have the corner points, which is what I do later in an example, they can do it like that. So lots of options. And these are the simple ones. And these are the slightly more complicated ones. Again, you can see there's, there's multiple options for building the same shape, depending on what the user knows. We've got more complicated TF coils and we've got more complicated blankets again. Um, so some of these shapes build off other shapes as well. So this one, for example, the, the casing, requires the user to input a TF coil, which is then cut away, a Boolean cut. So these components not only find the points in which to drive the parametric shapes, but they also do Boolean operations that are needed in their construction. They can be built from different shapes. This blanket is built from the plasma with a variable offset. So you provide the plasma, then you provide an offset from that plasma, and then you get the shape. So hopefully this is all making sense. Um, and here's a, a CAD production of each one of those parametric components that I just mentioned. Something to bear in mind is this is just a snapshot with fixed input parameters, but they can all vary. So this blanket one here can have a different thickness or a different offset. They can have different rotation angles or, or all sorts of different parameters that you saw in those labeled diagrams. This is an example of the cut operations one can do. So you can make a, a blanket 
which is this, this family of shape. You see in this diagram, we've got a little gap, but in this uh, use case, we have no gap. So that's a, an example of a parameter being used to change the shape appearance. We're just Boolean cutting and we're getting a more complicated blanket. And you can do more complicated blankets still. In this, um, in this example, we've got a tortoise shell and we're cutting away um, a rather chunky um, star shape. And then we're doing a skinnier tortoise shell and we're cutting away a narrow star shape. We're ending up with these two um, CAD models and then we're cutting them away from each other again. And we're also cutting away um, some square shaped port cutters and we end up with a fully parameterized, more complicated than its base shapes, uh, first wall kind of shape. So there's, there's lots of scope for making complicated components. Um, from parameter-driven scripts. When you put all of the parameters together in a specific way, we can wrap that in a reactor model. The reactor model's got a nice advantage of reducing the amount of inputs needed by the user. If you were to make all of these components again separately, you would need more inputs than this. We're we're reusing inputs on this particular design. So for example, one input is the thickness of this center column. Well, that thickness, the end of that is the start of the diverter region. So in this case, we can have one input for those two endpoints and that start point. And that continues throughout the whole reactor and it, it really drives down the number of inputs. We still have quite a lot, but it's a manageable amount. You have two more minutes, the, okay. Oh my goodness. I'm going to um, show you the example code for doing this. Um, and you have input driven parameter cre creation. This is another example for making an arc like reactor. So you've got uh, points on the uh, that have been grabbed from the, um, the diagram. And then you, you take those points and you can make a 3D model. So these are static models in this case, not just parametric models. This is our development, how we've ramped up the process. So we started off by making parametric shapes. That's the underlying core. And then we ramped up the production of components that rely on those shapes. And then we're ramping up the construction of parametric reactors. And I expect all of these will increase. Um, so what can you do with it? It's nice to have geometry, but if you wanted to use it for something useful, you can do automatic um, neutronics simulations. So here's our geometry construction that we saw earlier that will make your parametric reactor. And then it's saved as my reactor and it's put into this class and we just assign the extra materials. It's all Eurofair in this case. And then we say, say the simulation intensity we want the TBR and heating, and that will give us a simulation like this. So this is lots of parameters being varied, and we're looking at how the TBR varies as an isolated parameter. There's a lot of noise because everything else is also varying. Very easy to do with the right tools. Um, so we're employing some great software practices uh, like code coverage, continuous integration, and we have great documentation. Um, we analyzed the Neutronics workflow to really cut down on all the unnecessary manual parts. And we're using Intel's Embra toolkit. Um, so this presentation has got links in it, which if you're really interested, you can look at later. But this really speeds up the, the Neutronics simulations. And we're also using scalable Neutronics codes like OpenMC to really um, make everything as fast as possible. We're analyzing the use of CPU um, and we're trying to iteratively reduce the amount of dead time on the CPU usage by doing things like caching the nuclear data. Sorry, you have to finish. Okay. And this is the last slide, which I'll, I'll let you okay. um, read. Thanks very much. Okay, questions? We have a question. Uh, it's foreseen to, foreseen to use these parametric geometries for automatic optimization using gradient-based techniques such as the adjoint method? Um, if, if I understood correctly, is can you use the parametric geometry with, uh, with your own optimizer? Yes, yes, yes sure you, you can. Yes, you can um, 
you have to be able to use your own optimizer, of course. The, the Paramac doesn't deal with that optimizer for you. It's quite, um, it's quite a narrowly focused code, so this will make the geometry. Um, at the moment, it will also do some neutronics for you, but if you want to use an optimizer, you'd have to wrap that in um, yourself. It would just be a, a calling a function. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we are running out of time and we have to go to the next presentation. This session is finished now. Thank you all. Thank you. I think. So, Eddie, about the, uh, shall, shall I take over? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for staying until the end. So this is the, the last part of the workshop. Uh, we have one, one more talk to go. And that talk is given by Jordi Mars from Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the Spanish Supercomputing Network. Are you Jordi there? Yes, hello, I'm here, Mervi. Fantastic. So whenever you are ready to share your slides, okay, I'm please go share. ahead. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen and my slides. Uh, okay, they're here. Okay, I hope you see my. Uh, I hope you see my nostrum, eh? which uh, for those of you that you have not been here, it's a really fantastic place uh, to be. Just very brief presentation of the Spanish supercomputing network and especially the the resources eh, the resources the support of the network to the scientific community and I hope that uh, I know that some of you are users some of you are even uh, highly participating in the functioning in the works and the committees of the of the res so thanks for that and but of course we want to spread the the, the the let's make it more wider and wider so we can really have more users and more services which i will explain a little bit later okay the spanish supercomputing network is uh, is a network of supercomputers in spain uh, 13 supercomputers belonging to 13 institutions all over spain it was created 2006. Initially, it was only uh, providing HPC resources for the scientific community, but very, very recently, and this is a really a, a headline, a very recent news, we already have opened the call for that data projects. So right now we have data offering, also data services from the, from the Spanish supercomputing network besides computing time. Uh, well, we provide more than 600 million CPU hours a year for the projects of, of, the, of the scientific community. Uh, the computing time, the computing calls, they are divided in three times of the year, three calls per year. And uh, I have to say that uh, we ha really have, a, a besides allocating time, uh, for the supercomputer, we have a team of support people giving support, helping in any technical problem, any technical thing you may you may have by using the, the, the supercomputer. We have more than thousand regular users of the network and the time, and uh, there's a quite huge uh, output of all this participation with really nearly hundred scientific papers annually. Uh, the network is a member of the unique scientific and technical infrastructure network in Spain, and it's coordinated since its beginning uh, by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Here you have at the bottom part of the slide the, 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 the members of the network, which are, high, are diff as different supercomputers, <coughs> sorry, different universities all over Spain. and covering all the, all the area of the country. Uh, basically, the Spanish, uh, the RES is the, is the national 
reference for HPC. It provides, of course, uh, networking, education training, uh, an open window to internationalization of, of activities, of, of projects. And we also tend to uh, do a lot of some outreach activities and some dissemination activities towards society, towards companies. And as I said, there's a, it's already an emerging scientific big data network with already nine uh, nodes in this data network. Uh, well, I just I have very, very, I will go quickly with this slides because there are just some data you can have that you can find them in the in the website some technical information about teraflops, uh, uh, petaflops and so on and, and petabytes and all them all the technical information you you may want to you, you may want to know about the the different machines uh, of the network they are on the website so i don't think we should uh, the, the latest uh, to join the network is the nasertic yeah, the Uedera machine yeah, they are the agency in navarra yeah, in navarra region they are the responsible for hpc in navarra and they have joined uh, just a few months ago to the to the spanish supercomputing basically uh, uh, the rest provides access to different uh, issues to different items one of course mainly is supercomputing uh, time and super and data projects it provides also training access to knowledge access to internationalization access to innovation as i will say later and of course access to networking and also that we we run also some mobility programs uh, which you can use uh, these are the scientific areas we, we have divided up to now uh, the calls and the projects we are running. Uh, this is just a, a view of the amount of hours allocated to the projects. Yeah, it's nearly around six, 600 million a year, which are divided into these different disciplines. We run, as I said, three periods, uh, three calls uh, in one year. Uh, we have a list if you want to check that, if you want to look uh, how the which are the main papers. You can look at the website. There's information about some of our users publishing in, in nature, in science, in different, of course, in many, many different uh, journals all over. Um, uh, I will not go, I will not just go in detail because it's really, we don't have time, but there's a, the, the application process. It's, it's simple, but it's also very rigorous in both sides. It's, it's it's competitive time it's competitive money so we, we really stick to the 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 F evaluation the excellent evaluation of the proposal yeah. there's a formal evaluation there's an expert panel scientific expert panels that uh, value yeah, that evaluate each one of the activities and finally there's an access committee yeah. you can see all the information in the website i will go over rather quickly the, just for you to know the next deadline for application for the next period is january 12th so if you want to join us if you want to be user of the rest uh, resources be, be, be have in mind that the next uh, deadline is january 12th next year uh, well the all the information is in the in the web you just get into the intranet and you apply for your activity, you provide some information about the project, the kind of uh, software and, and, and application and libraries you need and so on, curriculum of the researchers, which machine do you prefer from the, from the network, and finally an abstract for publication. You have, so we have the calendar published in our website. Uh, just the, the, the recent news, a very, very, Few days ago, we just opened. This is from three days ago. We opened the first call for REST data project is now open. And so this this call will accept proposals that require storage, sharing, publishing, and connecting large data sets with computing and data services for exploitation. So, if you are interested in in in, in data projects, so please get. Uh, 
connect to our website and you will get all the information uh, from there. Um, we have also a users committee that uh, promotes the, the optimal use and voices the, the concerns of the users. Uh, this is general. We have also, of course, a satisfaction survey, which provides uh, really good results, I would say, uh, especially good results uh, when it comes to evaluating the support provided by, by, by my colleagues, my technical colleagues that really give, provide a, a tremendous support to the users. Uh, we have different um, outreach, different events uh, around the, the year. Of course, with this pandemic situation, we are going online, but we have a users meeting, which we did, uh, we did uh, online this year, September, la September this year, so two months ago. Was really a fantastic meeting. If you want to watch the videos, they are uploaded online, so you can watch them. We have scientific seminars. We promote. We support scientific seminars as the one you are uh, you are participating now with uh, uh, after the after the the initiative of of Mervi and, and and the other the other members of the program committee. Uh, we have some technical training, especially for technical people. Uh, and also, you may have you if you want you you will also provide some uh, information about uh, mobility grants for researchers, yeah? because we are members of the HPC Europa Three program of the of the European Commission. The next uh, deadline for this program is February 18th. Is the end of the next call for applications for this mobility program, which is really good, especially probably for young students that want to visit uh, different HPC facilities around the world. Regarding collaboration with industry, I would wanted to mention especially probably this, that, that we are members of, the, we are created also some very few months ago from September 1st, the National HPC Competence Center. Uh, so we are just deploying right now the program with uh, some um, some information for SMEs, for companies regarding competences in HPC. Yeah, so please, if you, this is specially aimed at uh, for industry, academia, and public administration, yeah, but probably especially aimed at SMEs access to HPC, which is really one of the big challenges nowadays in, in this technology field. If you want to follow us, uh, just you know, connect through the Twitter or website. We have news, we have newsletter. So whatever you feel you, you may find information, please, uh, you will find it there. And uh, just a couple of slides to finish. One about praise. We have BSC is a member, one of the, of the funding members of praise, or this network of of supercomputers all over Europe. And of course, it's also, there's also a program, an access program yeah? <coughs> with millions of core hours uh, for research uh, awarded to the, to the research projects and to the researchers in Europe. So if you need also some access, you can join the program. You can just visit the, the website. The access uh, website is here in the, in the slide. And of, and of course, there's the, the future is uh, also, uh, let's say, focus on this Euro HPC, which is a, a, a huge program that really wants to foster European HPC technologies in general. Yeah? And there is also so many, uh, many technological programs under the umbrella of this Euro HPC which also, if you are interested, uh, you also may have some a look to, to the programs and to the different. Euro HPC is, 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 let's say, the umbrella program, which Euro CC, the Euro Competence Center Network, is also, is also based. So just, uh, I would just keep, uh, because you, are, you have been so good in, in keeping the time that I didn't want to break the, the schedule. So, if, if you need anything from the Spanish supercomputing network, please visit us, visit our website, res.es, very simple. And you can 
easily reach us through any of the emails. And uh, of course, uh, thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you for Mervi and for the organization of this fantastic meeting uh, today. So if there's, of course, any question, I'll be more than uh, honored to answer anything you want. Thank you so much, Mervi, and I give you back the, the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. So time for questions to Jordi. Um, at the, the chat is open, so please feel free to, to ask anything about the resources. Um, as we saw, there's a wide variety of them available, and we feel very well supported, I think, by these, uh, these opportunities. Uh, anything special? Of course, Jordi provided us uh, all the links for further information, so it's easy to follow that up. So I do understand, and it's at the end of the day as well, after many presentations, I understand that it's quite tired. Well, there is. Yeah, I agree. Oh, very nice, uh, nice uh, comments. I that agree you with, come about. I agree with Jonathan. <laughs> okay, very nice uh, to get this positive feedback. Well, I, I think we move to the closing part. If I, I don't, I don't have any questions to Jordi at the moment. So, uh, thank you so much for the support thank you. that we Thanks have had. And then let's go to the closing. I, I have prepared some slides for this closing part. So let me try to share, share this, um, these slides. Now I think it should be possible. So um, as I already announced at the beginning uh, of the day, and main part of this closing is really um, to vote um, for the, your favorite talk, either invited or contributed talk. And um, basically we were thinking that um, we would allocate two minutes for the voting uh, business. And I believe uh, Rose would be providing us a link through the chat to do this voting. And as a reminder, we would be, well, aiming to select three most voted speakers um, and they will win these prizes that we mentioned already, Dan Brown's origin book uh, featuring Mare Nostrum, Barcelona and Spain, together with some equipment for your next video conferences, hopefully uh, well, making them uh, quite, quite nice. And those prizes are sponsored by um, Supercomputing Center and our group. So um, let me just check that we have the chat link. Do I manage to? Um, can somebody comment whether the chat link is there? Shall we start the voting? Yes, it's there. It's there. So let's go then.
So the time is up. Um, Rose, can you comment whether we have enough votes? Not the results yet. We have some time to analyze the results. What, well, we can talk about the, some practical issues in the meantime when, when, while we wait. But I understand that the votes are there and we will soon get the results. But uh, let's, let's talk about some practicalities um, here in the meanwhile. So the recordings, um, our aim is really to make these recordings available um, online. Um, and we will be emailing about that um, soon. Um, there might be some issues with these recordings. It's really first time that we are trying to do a whole, whole day <laughs> recording. So um, let's see how it goes. Um, and also all the talkers, um, speakers, please let us know if you are not happy that we make these recordings of your talk available online. We, of course, will um, completely respect your, your uh, word on it. Um, then other aspect that is important to us is that we would really like to get your feedback. How, how did the day go? Um, so help us improve. Um, there will be sort of post-event survey that we will send you. Uh, by email as well after the workshop. And then I know many of you are waiting for uh, news about this special issue uh, that we um, mentioned for the plasma uh, physics and com controlled fusion journal of IOP publishing. So this is, uh, we got lots of interest and we will be um, the program committee We'll be soon in contact with the speakers who have indicated or will indicate interest in submitting a special issue paper in this journal. And basically the deadline for submissions is expected to stay the same as we mentioned earlier, which is uh, the end of March 2021. And now I would like to check whether I have I have the results of the voting. So perhaps um, there's some, <laughs> some issues still here. Uh, are, we are sort of um, trying to finalize the counting. But I have already two top, top speakers to announce and then then while we wait for the third one. So I'm very happy to uh, announce the winners of these favorite talk awards. Um, the first award go to, goes to Jonathan Shimwell on the paramac automated parametric geometric construction for future reactor analysis. Congratulations, Jonathan, well done. Um, the second uh, prize goes to Herani Makarthia on fast ions as a source of transport suppression in jet plasmas. Um, many, many congratulations to Herani as well. And now I need to now I need to see. Yes, and the third prize goes to Maria Jose Caturla on the role of high performance computing in predictive models for microstructure evolution of irradiated uh, iron and uh, iron chromium alloys. So congratulations to Maria Jose as well. And many thanks for all 
all of you for your votes. Um, we will be in contact with the winners uh, very shortly uh, for the shipment of these prizes that we mentioned earlier. And then basically, um, let me see, uh, yeah. Um, this is it. I, um, we have come to the end of a very interesting day. I want to really thank uh, um, from the bottom of my heart, all the speakers, all the fellow program and local um, organization committee members, all the institutions involved, and um, among all, <laughs> all of you who participated. It has been a really fantastic day. And thank you for being there. Uh, well, I have enjoyed the day tremendously, and I have enjoyed um, all the talks, and I hope you as well. We have really seen um, how wide the field is and how many applications um, of HPC we have in the future field. It's really exciting and fast, fast progressing uh, field. And basically, I want to say goodbye. See you next time. The plan is that really when the situation allows, we would organize the next edition of this workshop hopefully in person in Barcelona and with the great support from and sponsorship from the uh, Spanish uh, supercomputing network. So thank you so much and see you. See you soon. Thank you, Melvi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.